Tonight, let's dive straight into it. Okay, you ready for it? You're going to have to be honest with me tonight. You're going to have to, uh, a bit of truth serum tonight. I want some interaction, some uh, interactive church tonight. And uh, this is family, say yeah. And uh, uh, you'll see what I mean by that as we go through tonight's message. Um, Put your hand up, honestly. If you could convincingly tell, teach someone, take someone that you didn't know uh, through the Scriptures, an unbeliever, a stranger off the street, as to what it is to be saved, who Jesus Christ is, uh, the pathway to that salvation and a reassurance that they have been saved. Say four or five Scriptures that you could lead them through, open up your Bible and uh, honestly take someone through the Word of God. Just raise your hand in the air if you could do that. Okay. Probably 15 hands, 20 hands in a room the size of this. There's no shame in that. There's no condemnation. Tonight is not a, uh, you know, you know that and you don't. This is uh, simply wanting to equip people and encourage you, hey, if we wanna be the army of God and if we wanna see revival, uh, we've gotta be equipped to bring that and lead people to Jesus Christ. Uh, Here's another uh, poll. Uh, Put your hand up if you know what the Great Commission is. Okay, that's better. That's better. You're probably a third to a half. Put your hands up. Okay, tonight I'm going to talk to you about how to lead someone to Jesus through the Scriptures. Are you excited by that? (laughs) Number one, how to teach yourself to lead yourself through the Scriptures to Jesus, but I also want this for you to help family, friends, strangers, those that you come in contact with, those in your world, how to actually practically lead them to Christ through the Word of God. You know, St. Francis of Assisi, I believe, said that uh, preach the Gospel if necessary, use words. So our life exudes Christ all the time. And you know, that's, that's extremely important. But after you've prayed for Sister Susie and after you've baked her a cake and you've given her a prophetic word and you've laid hands on her and you've seen Sister Susie seen miracles in her life and she, she's convinced that, you know, Jesus is real. You know, there, there's actually a, a process where Sister Susie has to come to the Word of God and be reassured of her salvation that she knows Christ and that her soul is saved. We all have to come to that place. It's so integral that we know the Word of God. We can have great encounters and great moments and what we call sort of breakthrough moments in our lives. But the way that we walk and journey with Christ uh, is so important. And, and, And the way that we do that is we hide the Word of God in our hearts. David says that we might not sin, but that we almost, we might grow at the same time. And there is, there is no growth without the Word of God in our hearts. And so this is really, really practical tonight. A little different for me, but it's essential because this statistic scares me. It scares me a lot. And when I read it, I was like, as a pastor, if I ain't preaching this message tonight, I might as well leave my occupation, my vocation, because This is at the heart of the church. When asked, it says, if they had heard of the Great Commission, this is churchgoers, in 2017, by the way, in the Barnard study, half of US churchgoers, 51%, so they do not know this term. 25% said, yes, but I can't recall the exact meaning. 6% said, I'm not sure. And... 17% said yes, and it means this. Okay, this is very, very frightening. Thunderbolts of lightning. (laughs) No, that just entered my head. It's amazing what enters your head when you preach. But that is so, so frightening because believers don't know what the mission is. They're wandering around aimlessly, trying to get 
all the things and all the help and it's all great and all the feels and, and you know, we've got this sort of picture of, you can be saved in church and, and, and be part of this thing called the church and actually not be, no, not be told or have a revelation of what the mission is. Sometimes the church can just be like a hospital for people or a counselling room, which is important. That's the first step. But once you get healed and fixed up and, you know, set free, saved and delivered, there is a mission for you to do. This is not to stroke your ego or just, you know, have all your problems fixed. Gee, hey, none of us are good enough and we've all got problems. But Jesus says, hey, if I've saved, set and free and delivered you, get on your bike and let's go with the mission. Because there are people wandering around aimlessly, full of themselves, looking inwards all the time. And Jesus says, hey, look outwards. There are people that don't know the Great Commission. What is the Great Commission? Half of you are asking right now. I'm glad you are inside. This is what it is. Matthew 28, 18. You should know this. In fact, after you give your life to Jesus, this is what should be told to you. Go, Jesus came and said to them, who? The disciples. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. All nations. Baptising them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. This is a command. Jesus is commanding them. Go and behold, I'll be with you all the ways to the end of the age. You know, Jesus, I believe when we get there, He's gonna, he's gonna ask us this question. Did you go? Did you go and make learners and lovers of Jesus Christ? That is what a disciple is. If you're a barista, did you go and make learners and lovers of Jesus Christ? If you're a stay-at-home mom with 15 kids, did you go and make learners and disciples of your children, of the people around you when you can, when God places unbelievers in our lives, whatever you are, doctor, lawyer, athlete, musician, did you go and make disciples? Because that is the mission. You don't go into war not knowing the strategy. You get wiped out. But when you've got a mission, when you've got something burning in your heart and the simplicity of this message is, is in the profundity of it is, is so vital that we get it because you know, sometimes well, I want the deep stuff. Friend, it doesn't get any more revelatory than the work of Jesus Christ and the simple Gospel. Honestly, it doesn't. We need, to, we need to get our heads and minds and hearts around this and watch what God does. It's amazing when you go and look outward how you get healed inward and, and, and rejuvenated inward and a lot of your problems seem to dissipate when, you, when you're looking outwards. Don't get me wrong, God cares. God, you know, God wants to heal and save and set free and deliver you of all the things that We've all got, but He's saying, hey, look outwards, go now. Go, stop waiting for something extra. Like you're lacking or void of something. You've got the full Gospel. You've got Jesus and all He needs, amen? So this is why it's so integral. And I'm gonna give you a lot of passages from Romans tonight because I'm gonna take you sort of through my own version of what's called the Romans Road. Has anyone heard of the Romans Road before? Yeah, we've got a few hands tonight. Cool, so that was developed by a Baptist guy in the 1960s. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's flawed in some ways and I'll get to that in a minute, but we're gonna to add to it. So it says in Romans 10, 14, how then will they call on Him whom they had not believed? And how are they to believe in whom him of whom they have never heard. And how are they to hiss without someone preaching? How are they to preach or teach, you can put there, unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. You know, it's simple. How are people going to know the saving message of Jesus Christ if no one tells them it? Like I said, you can, you can model it and you can, you can do all the things, but someone's got to tell them. Someone's got to teach and preach. It goes on two verses later. Faith comes by hearing and hearing from the, the Word, the Word of God, the Word of Christ. 
Faith comes when you hear the Word of Christ, Christ in flesh. It builds your faith. It grows your faith. Revelation is possible because you heard the Word and faith could be enacted. I was thanking Jesus today that out of six billion people on the earth, I was privileged enough to be presented the Gospel. Think about that. There are people who haven't heard it yet. I was like, Jesus, thank You that I was presented the Gospel in a small country town in Australia. I, I grew up, yeah, in Catholic circles, not knowing Jesus. And, and You led me to places and relationships. And, you know, I, You just led me to a place where I could respond in faith. That is such an amazing gift. It's so beautiful. Never take that for granted. Kenneth Hagen, and remember him? You cannot believe beyond your own, uh, beyond your actual knowledge of God's Word. This is the reason many people for, fail in their prayer life and their faith. You think about that. You cannot believe beyond the knowledge of God's Word. Everything comes from that, in essence. So, the, the, you know, the more that you've got in you, the more that you have the ability to believe. And God will show you in dreams and visions as He does to Muslims and all kinds of people around the world. They're, they're, they're having pictures and images of Jesus. But then again, they're gonna be led to the Word of God. Who is this Jesus that we're talking about? And what has He done for us? So, by the way, did you scan the QR code at the beginning? They're all my slides and notes. You can have them. Do you wanna see it again? I've gotta go back here. I've gotta go back. I've gotta go back. I've gotta go back. I've gotta go back. There we go. There we go. Scan that QR code. These are all my notes. And uh, you can have all these as a reference for the rest of your life to practice, to marinate in, to remember, to, 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 to follow what I call sort of this path, this river. All right, so these are the passages. They don't have to be just these passages, but I want you to get this sort of rhythm and this, this road that I'm going down, which builds an argument and it builds a case for the need of Christ, okay? That's enough time if you missed it. Um, talk to your friend. <laughs> Here we go. Romans 1, 3, 6, 5, 3, 10, 8, 8. Okay, even if you can remember Romans 1, 3, 6, 5 and 10. Okay, amazing. And the eights, the eights are all assurance passages. Okay, uh, my goal, uh, Martin Luther said this, you know, this. you say, well, this is so easy. I learned this uh, 10, 15 years ago. Friends, 86% of churchgoers don't grasp this. They don't know this. Martin Luther, the great reformer said, I preach the gospel to my people every week because they forget it every week. Tim Keller, Amazing author, pastor in New York City said, one of the signs you may not grasp the unique radical nature of the gospel is that you're certain that you think you do. Familiarity, overconfident, you know, like I've been around, I know stuff, you know, that's, that's a, that's, you know that, that doesn't do us any favours. So this is the river, this is the pathway that we're gonna go. We're gonna talk about the Father, God the Father, who He is. We're gonna talk about sin, how it affects us. Jesus, what He's done for us, faith, how we receive salvation and assurance, how we know we've been saved. Okay, this is the pathway that you can keep as a template in your heart and in your mind as to know Christ and to lead someone to Christ. Okay, Father, sin, Jesus, faith, assurance. Now, most discipleship programs, they start with sin. And I don't like that. Because the Bible doesn't start with sin. When you meet someone you don't know, you don't just go and hit them up about their sin. That's called Bible bashing. That turns people away from God. People know how bad they are. You don't have to tell them. Well, maybe they do and I'll get to that in a minute. But they have a general idea. What was in the beginning? Relationship, intimacy, God walking with Adam in the cool of the garden, there was goodness and more goodness and good and good and good and great and it was beautiful and it was perfect and it was the made, man made in the image of God. That's what's in the beginning. So it's important that we present God the Father in this way first to people. 
People see that, people pick up on that. And a passage to do that is outside the Romans road and it's Exodus 34. This is the first time God reveals Himself in a real sort of detailed way to any human on earth. And that is Moses. All right, in Exodus 34, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands of generations, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Pretty good God. Slow to anger, merciful, steadfast in love, forgives iniquities but who will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. We get, ugh, I don't like that part. This says that God has love, grace, mercy, but He's also a God of justice. You cannot be of love if you cannot be just. The world will go, everything's about love. But they don't want to know the just God. They don't want to know the righteous God, okay? Those two things are the very nature and fabric of our God that we serve. God, Yahweh, Elohim, El Shaddai, the the God of Israel, the God of the earth, okay, is just and is loving and is graceful and is merciful. Now, 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 we should, if we're made in His image, we should feel those things and we should display those things. Are we slow to anger? Man, if you've got toddlers, that'll test every part of that. Patience and just all that. You know, like why we feel a sense of justice for things and we, man, that really just irks me inside and man, drives people to, to push and advocate for things is because you're made in the image of a just God. And I'm going to go a little, a little deeper here with this. Okay, stay with me. C.S. Lewis said this statement when he was trying to discover the truth and who was really God in a matter of many religions he, he went after. And, and this is what he says, My argument with God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. Anyone heard that before? That's, that's one of people's biggest obstacles. He says this, but how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he knows what a straight one is. Are you with me? So what was I comparing the universe with when I called it unjust? What's he saying? He's saying, my heart as a human cries out and says, that's not the way it ought to be. And I know something of a straight line because I know what crooked and corrupt and cruel is. I've had a, 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 a taste of straight. So, you know, there's someone out there, not just a something, a someone out there that has to be just. Because what was I comparing this world of unjust with? If I'm feeling unjust, it means there's someone That is just. And that is what science cannot explain. Okay? So this is a classic argument. How could God exist if the world is like this and if people are being raped and murdered and violence and corruption? Yeah, that doesn't disqualify the existence of God. It actually says, propels it because you feel such an unjust against the, the, the things of the world that it says, wow, my, my heart cries out. And we know this because God has set eternity in our hearts. Whether you know it or not, well, you do because you're here, because you've had the revelation, because you've had the Word preached to you and your faith is enacted upon that to believe. But there are many unbelievers who are still created in the image of God that sense these things because they have eternity in their hearts. They just haven't had the revelation of that. That's how important faith is. So here we go. We talk about the Father. Say yeah if you're with me tonight. I know this is really different, but it's, it's vital. 119. So this is also how we can know the existence of the Father God because we know it through the invisible attributes Namely, His eternal power, divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been 
made so they are without excuse. In other words, this creation exudes something of the nature of God that should draw you to Him because every design has a designer. The building didn't build itself. A painting doesn't paint itself. A car doesn't build itself. Okay, behind a car is a car maker, a watch, behind a watchmaker. There is a designer that, that, that everyone is without excuse. So this is, a, this is an interesting passage, but we can't deny this. And this is where science is not the contrary of God and His creation. It affirms His masterpieces in many ways and it tries to discover the beauty and the magnificence of God. So we're not anti-science. I'm actually an old science teacher, by the way. So there you go, there's a fact for you. But, but these are two things that science can't prove. Again, these are some of the arguments that people will bring to you. So I'm trying to help with some of those things. Uh, science can't prove that uh, a moral truth, number one, a moral truth. Science can't prove that murder is evil or, or rape is evil and that sharing is good. It can't do that. It can't unpack moral truths. In other words, there is no test for morality with science. People end up, you know, atheism and just, I'm just a science guy and bang, the whole world. Well, well, well that's, that's not going to cut it because you're not going to be ex- able to explain moral truths. You can look at a murder scene and, and evidence and, and analyse and yada, yada, but, but you, can't, you can't explain why, if that's good or evil. This is some of the arguments of C.S. Lewis that he makes. Experiential truth. Science cannot prove that someone loves you. Rachel and Neiman, married, love each other, write each other cards, send each other text messages each, every day. Neiman buys flowers every other week, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's still, science ain't gonna be able to prove if Neiman loves Rachel and Rachel loves Neiman. Only the heart can do that. Do you see? It's, it's, in, it's insufficient, it's insufficient. All right, so we move from father to sin. What's it done to us? All right, we should all know this. Romans 3, 23, all have what? All have and fallen of the? Say glory louder. There we go, of God. Now we look at the first part of this verse and we go, yeah, okay, condemnation, yeah. I didn't make it, I didn't make the card. We sin, we sin every day. Okay, this, this is better translated. For all have sinned in Adam, All have sinned in Adam, and when he sinned, we all sinned, and fallen short of being an image bearer of God, of glory. So I would like to emphasise the glory part because this is what we spend billions and trillions of dollars trying to fix. It's called Botox, (laughs) liposuction, therapy, Self-motivation books. This is what we're all trying to get to. The Edenic, the Eden paradise. We're trying to get to the, back to the place of glory where we were made in the image of God in perfection. Now, of course, we don't lose that, but it is tainted and marred. Okay, so everybody has something of the nature and eternity in the hearts of men, as I said before, but it's tainted, it's been stripped divested of us and we're all seeking that glory and we spend money and we spend our life and energy and all kinds of things. What are we really trying to do? We're trying to get to the place of glory that we're created in. And sin, we fall short of that. Okay, truth serum test. Are you ready to interact? Some of you are nervous right now. Has anyone ever lied in this room? Put up your hand if you've lied. There are, there are people with their, out their hands up. <laughs> There's no pressure. There's no condemnation for me. I just be honest with you. Okay. What do you call someone who lies? A liar. Now, I learned a lot of this stuff from a man called Ray Comfort. And uh, he's amazing and teaches this. And he's building a case, okay? Building a case for the need. Okay, we know what sin is. Uh, because this is, the, this is the great deceit of the average person on the street is that they think that they're good. If you ask anyone on the street, are you a good person? Okay, you're not even a Christian. But if you ask anyone, they'll say, yeah, I'm good. What are they doing? They're comparing themselves to somebody else or they're quantifying their 
sin. Or I didn't do as much as that person, so I'm good. I'm not a terrorist, so I'm a better person. I didn't go to prison, so I'm, I didn't fall 70 times, only 35. You see what I'm saying? This is the earthly standard that we, that we judge ourselves with, but it's fundamentally flawed. Okay, so all right, we've got a whole bunch of lies in the room. Are you feeling encouraged about being to church tonight? This is what you present to people. Okay, uh, has anyone stolen something in the room before? Lift your hands. Okay, yeah, 75% of us have stolen. What do you call someone who steals things? Yeah, all right. So now we've got some lying thieves in church tonight. Feel the love. All right, has anyone used the name of God as a, as a cuss word? Has anyone done that before in their life? Just lift your hands to the air. Don't look around. Don't look around your neighbours. Just lift your hand. Okay, what do you call someone who cusses? A blasphemer. Okay, so we're lying thieves, blasphemous lying thieves. All right, uh, I told you, it gets better. Just, just hang with me. All right, here's, here's another one. Uh, the Bible says, if you walk at somebody uh, lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart. Anyone in this room looked at someone lustfully before? Don't lie to me. Don't lie to God. We will do an altar call right now for repentance and pride. Come down here. Get on your knees. No, just joking. All right. We all have. Why? Because God's wired us that way and it's gone perverted in a way that it wasn't meant to. So now we're adulterous, blasphemous, lying thieves. Are you still a good person? See, now the, now the person on the street's going, mm, I'm, mm, yeah, I'm not as good as I thought I was. So these things are punishable by death in the Old Testament. Did you hear me? Punishable by death in the Old Testament. This is what sin is. So if you ask someone, what, do you know what sin is? What is sin? Sin is wages. Sin is wages. Romans 6.23. So we've got Romans 3.23, 6.23. Easy to remember, they're on. 23. For the wages of sin is death. You get paid in death. We get paid in death for our shortcomings, for all the things that separate us between um, us and God is wages of death, okay? That's what we get paid out in. All right, I'm gonna do a little, uh, I'm gonna do a little doodling for you right now. Is that okay? I'm gonna take you back to classroom. All right, if you're visual, this really helps us. Okay, so over here, can you see that? You've got, all right, so here, here you've got, okay. Hey, I've got skills, I need some eyebrows. He's a postmodern Christian, so he's got the earring. Okay. <laughs> he needs some muscles, there you go. <laughs> this is man, all right? He thinks he's pretty good, strong. In charge, he's intelligent, he knows everything. He, he's the master of his own life. The fact is that there's this big chasm, okay? This chasm here uh, of fire, okay? And he, here's the, you know, the devil with his little rabbit ears and uh, he's looking very sad because he knows he's lost the fight and uh, he's got a pitchfork that is, I don't know where the pitchfork come, but he's like, okay, I'm gonna get you, all right. So he got, he knows he's defeated. And uh, over here we have God who is love. And uh, yeah, that's the best way I can draw God. And so <laughs> we need to get to God, but we know that there's a big chasm in the middle. And what's this chasm called? Sin equals death, okay. So all under that, you get fear and shame and pride and all kinds of things. Excuse my handwriting. So, so you've got this issue, dilemma, punishable by death. I need to get to the Father God because I'm created in His image and I know He's loving and slow to uh, anger and abounding in mercy, but He's also just and I've fallen short. So how do I get to Him? Real simple. Okay, how do we get to Him? We need a bridge and that bridge is the cross. That bridge, the only way that you can get to the Father, okay, is through Jesus. We're gonna talk a bit later, 
But the way that you get to Jesus is only by faith. And that gets you to God. This, yeah, if you want to give a round of applause to Jesus, give a round of applause to Jesus. That's what He's done for you. That is what He's done for you. So sin, we can't tolerate it. It's a big deal. There are any preachers preaching right now and, and, and theology out there that, that is called annihilation theory. That is that nothing happens to you when you die. You just, you don't get to be with Jesus. It's not a, it's not a uh, dismissive of hell. I still say hell exists, but it's just nothing. It's, it's, it's deceitful. Because Matthew 26, 45 says, uh, there's eternal life and there's eternal punishment. Revelations 4 and Revelations 14 talk about those who worship the beast and the beast and the false prophet, the Antichrist themselves will be thrown into a lake of fire and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Day and night forever and ever, okay? So there's something eternal about that. That sin has eternal consequences. Our souls live on forever. It just depends which place. So sin has done some nasty things to us. Even that, in Ephesians 2, outside the Romans road, we are nature, by nature, children of wrath. Children of wrath? Wow. We're called the sons of disobedience. What's wrath? God's wrath in a holy, righteous God burns with with fire because He's so pure and His nature is so righteous that He can't have anything to do with sin, that His nature burns with wrath against that which is sin. And we are the sinful ones. And so the wrath, we are children of wrath, okay? Do you see why this is not just a nice idea of a religion? This is not just a therapeutic sort of counselling session or that can be helpful. We need saving. I was on a plane, a lovely couple from Seattle, you know, and, and, and you know, sometimes I, I just dig, I dig, I dig, I just be nice. I, I ask for anything to pray for sometimes, you know, they ask what I am. I say I'm a motivational speaker. Oh, wow, what are you talking about? I talk about Jesus. Oh, okay. Switch off. But I was probing, I was probing, you know. And, and so this is, this is what they said. So I'm going to present all the religions to my daughter. She said, just all of them. And she can choose the one that she wants to choose. I said, there's nothing wrong with that because every individual needs to come to a reality of the truth. Sometimes we can pump things into our kids and tell them that Jesus is the way and that they've got no understanding who Jesus is and they, they grow up and they go to seminary or university and it's challenged and they walk away from God because they've got no solid foundation because they got told and they didn't understand. They didn't have a personal revelation for themselves. So there's nothing wrong with doing that. But if once you've done it all, you're gonna come back to this one thing that the human race has a sin problem, a conscious problem that you can't escape. And if you believe in good and evil, then you believe in the Christian verbiage that we are sinners. And it's not just a nice thing to, to worship something else. Is that something else going to save your life? Are they going to rescue you? Are you assured that whatever you're worshipping is going to save you? Because the soul needs rescuing. The soul needs healing. The soul needs delivering. And you can't find that when you look into yourself. It's just found in, in the universe. It's pantheism. It's in the speaker. And God's in the, in the clouds. God created everything. You know, C.S. Lewis said about that. He said, pantheism. You know, God's sort of everything and everywhere. It's like a book on the shelf. It's nice, but it doesn't really want me. There's no personal pursuit. That's what led him to the heart's longing. There's got to be something personal. There's got to be an interaction. And there's nothing like the nature of God who sends His Son personally to die for us. That we might not have this consequence of sin. So as I drew that picture there, Jesus said to him in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the what? Except through me. Except through me. There's only one way. What a statement. You, Jesus is either a liar, lunatic, or He's Lord. C.S. Lewis said. And people can say other things, but ultimately, he's, that's a big statement. 
I am the way, the truth and the life. Is this helpful? Say yeah. yeah. All right, we're under Jesus. We're under the good stuff now. Whew. We got through it. This is what He's done for us. Romans 5, 8. But God shows His love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God shows, present tense. Christ died, past tense. So God is presently showing what Christ past did. God is presently showing while we're sinners, while you're still suck, stuck in your sin and, and sinning, that Christ died for you right now. Past, present, future. That's the beauty of this verse in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. It said, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God proves His love for us. In a, while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Okay, we move on to Romans 3.24. We're justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. Whom God put forward as a what? Yeah, I can't say that word, it's too long. Propitiation. By His blood to be received by faith. Why? Because to overcome death, we need life and life is found in the flesh. And what's in the flesh? Blood. That's why animal sacrifice was the precursor to Christ dying because you had to have blood and death to bring life. So, okay, back to school. Back to school for a few seconds here. When you see big words in the Bible, don't skip over them. Oh, is that how you spell it? Yes. Propitiation. You're never going to use it probably in your whole life. But you can know what it means. Okay, and it actually has sort of two meanings. All right, now the Greek is hilasterion. Okay. That's the Greek meaning. You're never going to use that word in your life. But if you look that up in the original Greek, it will tell you hilasterion. What's hilasterion? Glad you asked. Okay. This is what you might know it means. Okay. can be translated in Hebrews chapter 9. When you read of the mercy seat, you'll see the word hilasterion. Propitiation is the mercy seat of God. What's the mercy seat, you ask? In the Old Testament, it is the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God that had the cherubim and the angels. It was actually the lid of the, of the Ark covered in gold that was called the Hilasterion. In Hebrew, it actually would have been called the Kaporet. In Greek, it's translated Hilasterion. Kaporet is where we get the word sort of cover, where we actually get the word out of that of kippur. And Jews wear kippurs on their head. Why? Because they're being covered. Covered as a symbolic covering of the presence of God. Father God pr uh, covers them as they go about their life. It's also the, uh, the stuff on the edge of the ark with the sealed, the water getting in. It's, uh, we get kaporet, uh, words like that, that, that uh, kafir, that, that black tar, asphalt substance on the ark is, is a covering. Okay, so we know that, that they had to sacrifice bulls and the blood. In uh, Exodus 24, Moses keeps half the blood in bowls and he splashes all of it on there, the rest of it onto the mercy seat. And so we come to passages in the New Testament, like Hebrews chapter 9, where you know the, the blood of bulls and goats uh, was, was splashed upon the altar and our consciences have been cleansed, have been sprinkled with blood. How much more Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, cleanses our conscience from all sin as His blood is poured out for us, okay? So this is what the mercy seat is, propitiation. And it actually means, okay, we can go a little, uh, see the razor, okay. Appease. Appease. What's appease? When party A transgresses party B, you need a third party to appease the, the transgression. That third party is Jesus Christ and He appeases what? The wrath of God. He settles the wrath of God 
as the sacrifice because He's given of His own life, death and blood once and once for all. That's what the propitiation is. Say amen if you're with me. Okay, and the other word that you get from uh, propitiation is uh, expiation. Okay, and that's where we get forgive, uh, cleanse, wash, okay, and most of all, atone. Atonement is expiation and propitiation. Okay, it is atoned, it is covered, at one meant. At one moment, Christ died, died for all, and it was covered, it was atoned just as it was for Israel who sins. I told you we go to school tonight. Romans 10, 9, we're getting there. Okay, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. This is how we receive Jesus. Faith is the next step. You don't have to be water baptised. You don't have to speak in tongues. You don't have to do a dance. You don't have to pray and fast and do all kinds of things. No, you are saved with the confession of your faith, the belief in your heart, you will be saved. Those who call upon the name of Jesus will be saved. You say, go for repeat a pair and I've got the formula and am I saved? I get to go to heaven? This is the deal. Belief, look up the word belief. Follow after, leave your life behind. Pursue with your heart, soul, mind, strength. Believe is to do all those things, to follow and you will be saved. It is to know Christ, okay? And so we have Ephesians 2, 8, which we all should know this. For by grace you have been saved, what? By grace, through faith, it's not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Think about every other religion. Every other religion requires works. It's the big difference. It requires something to appease the God, the gods. The Greek mythology, it's filled with it. You have to work yourself to God, but God comes to us. God comes to us as a free gift. You don't have to do anything but receive and believe by faith. No matter what you've done, where you've come from, how bad you think you've messed up, there is a propitiator, the blood of Jesus Christ that appeases the wrath of God for whatever you've done, past, present, future. If you believe, repent, you can receive it by faith. And this is how we know we're assured. And therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We should have peace when we believe and when we know the Word of God in our hearts. Another Romans 8, 14, for all who are what? Led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. We heard about this last week. You know, it's believed in Christian tradition that when people were baptised, the Gentiles come out of the water, they said this statement, Abba Father, Abba Father. The other use of that word Abba Father, I think there's three in Scriptures when Jesus is in Gethsemane and He's not, not God, Father, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, but your be done. Abba Father, let this cup pass from me. It's, it's a symbol of His submission to His Father. And as we are submitting to Jesus Christ, we know that we are adopted by His Spirit because no one comes to Jesus unless the Holy Spirit draws them. And we can cry the words, Abba, Father. In other words, by faith, through Jesus Christ, we are restored to a relationship with our Father. It's now not just God and human, it's Father, Son, Father, Daughter. It's a new dynamic of intimacy and relationship. There is nothing like it, world. And our world needs to hear it. And they're gonna hear it through you. Come on, church, it's time to share our faith without excuse. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. These are. These are Scriptures that will train you that in your heart, I know I can be confident, I can be assured. But step out there, show someone the Word of God through your life, but lead them through the Scriptures because someone is waiting for you because you're the only Jesus they'll get to meet.
Revival would break out if we did this. People want to hear of a Saviour. Oh, people are offended with church and Christians and their perception of church. When you tell them about Jesus, oh. I watched a little documentary on the Chosen series and a whole bunch of Gen Z guys watching the Chosen series about Jesus. Didn't have any context, or they had context of church and Christianity before. But when they watched the Chosen series, they were like, most of them were crying. Most of them didn't realise that Jesus could be so kind, so graceful, so truthful, so just, so righteous, so approachable, so loving, so tender, so convicting, so compelling, so perfect. Because what they'd been presented with was nothing like that. Judgmental, condemning, religious, boring. (laughs) I'm convinced people are bored. If you're bored with Jesus, it ain't Jesus' fault. Something about your revelation you have not uncovered yet. It should burn. It should burn like fire. As a pastor, I, 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 I fear and tremble even preaching the Word of God. It's like, suddenly you feel so unworthy to deliver this magnificent not just piece of literature, but it's so holy, it's so beautiful, it's so rich. It's, and we can't, it's just the Bible, it's just got 15 of them sitting on my shelf at home, and 25 apps on my phone. And, oh, it's like, it's the solution, it's the answer. He is the answer. Romans 8, 38. I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rules, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Why? So the Gentiles were struggling. Were, what if I get lost and these pagan entities are gonna affect me and these spirits and everyone they worship, I'm gonna lose and they're gonna come back and they're gonna overtake me. Paul assures them, nothing, 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 nothing. Nothing in all the world, no circumstance. Nothing happened to you can separate you from the love of God. Nothing that you've done, it's beautiful. It's no, it's a peace that passes all understanding. You know, you know, you know, you know. Why? Because you're led by the Spirit of God and you can cry, have a Father with assurance that I am saved, set free and delivered. And I've got a mission to tell people. So here it is. These are the passages, Romans 1.19, God the Father 3.23. Of all sins, fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 5, 8, while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Be assured of our faith. Receive it, confess by our mouth, believe in our heart that Jesus Christ died for us and be assured nothing on earth can separate us from the love of God. Nothing in all the heavens and the earth, a demon, an angel, anything. That is, that is the pathway. But friend, as Gordon Fee said, a theology that does not begin and end with worship is not a biblical theology at all. It's just a product of Western philosophy. These are all concepts. Unless they're in here. It's all knowledge unless it burns, unless it's worship, unless it's given, unless it's lived. And that is the challenge. To not be a Christian for so long that you become stale bread and people are crying out for fresh manna. (laughs) 